A question cavers are often asked is, I don't want to, or stated from people who don't go caving, is I don't want to go caving, it's claustrophobic, I don't think I'd like that. I can honestly say that in 38 years of caving, I have only once ever felt claustrophobic. The time was 1979, I was a mere 17 years old, and I was abseiling into a chamber in northern Spain called the uh, Torca de la Calista. And as I abseiled down into the darkness, all I could see was the rope going up above me, and that was it, despite the lovely uh, torch that I had on my light. And of course, that felt claustrophobic, because my eyes were wide open, and yet I couldn't see. And I was abseiling into this, the Gran Sala Torca de la Calista in Spain, which at the time was probably the largest cave in the world, although nobody really, the largest cave chamber in the world, although nobody really thought terribly much about those things. And that, without a doubt, gave me uh, an appetite for searching for these big places, because they are absolutely magnificent. As you can see, this particular ca uh, chamber in Spain has been known for, what, the best part of 50 years now, and is reasonably well frequented, but it still remains a very, very magical place. The idea for surveying these caves, it came from a number of different sources, and we all disagree about it, um, but it came about because of the fantastic new technology called laser scanning uh, technology, which enables you to uh, measure these things with great accuracy. And I'm going to show you how that works a little bit later on by actually measuring this room and all of you lovely people. And the results from our scan were some incredibly detailed surveys that looked something like this. We were able, in this particular case, to actually map the surface and actually, you know, uh, identify the uh, relationship between the surface and the cave chamber itself in, in enormous detail. And we're only just beginning to learn what to do with this data, and uh, Professor Pete Smart's going to go on after me and show you some of the very early work that we're doing in, uh, in, in, in dealing with all of this data. So where are these big cave chambers? Basically, they're all over the world. Where there's limestone big enough to have it, there are big chambers. There's no particular pattern. We've just come from Spain, but the next place I want to go to is a very, very good favourite of ours over in Borneo, is uh, Sarawak, which was discovered in 1980 um, by uh, a, a British caving group, of you, which we've heard, learned, heard a lot about so far this, uh, uh, this weekend. But just to give you some idea of scale about how big they are, I'm presuming that many people in this room actually know what that is, and to put it in the same scale as Sarawak Chamber itself, it looks something like this. They are, these chambers really are very, very big indeed. Just to give you an idea, taking the football analogy, if you look at the inside volume of a typical football stadium, even Wembley Stadium, it's 1.3 million cubic metres. Well, Sarawak is the best part of 10 million cubic metres. They are, you know, the biggest cave chambers are roughly 10 times the volume of the inside of a, a, a typical uh, national football stadium. They are absolutely enormous. These photographs taken by our good friend Carsten Peter for National Geographic again show you with some fantastic photography what these places are really like. And I heard somebody say that Ch Sarawak Chamber is rather boring. Well, in one instance, it is rather boring, but because it's a huge big boulder field. But actually, what our cave surveys have shown, there's actually an awful lot of features, an awful lot of geology, an awful lot of interest in this, which can be gleaned, which make these places absolutely fascinating. In the field, Having scanned this chamber, which took three day, four days underground, we were actually able to put together a small fly-through to give you some idea of the scale of these things. And this, again, it's not perfect, it's glitchy, there's noise in it, but it's what we were able to do in the field um, to illustrate what these chambers are like. And I've left the cavers, where's the pointer, there in yellow, so they actually show up. Uh, Andy's down on a rock down there, and Tim Allen is up there on a rock up there. Tim Allen, of course, wasn't present on the expedition. I took that scan of him on Lech Fell and superimposed it later, but we won't take too much fuss about that. But what this scan showed us for the first time is we always knew this chamber was very big, but this arch that you see at the top end is absolutely fascinating. It is probably uh, the largest natural arch in the world, and as uh, Pete Smart will go on and tell us later, how it stands up, we are only just beginning to understand because civil engineers don't believe that it's possible for it to stand up. But again, there's Tim disappearing into the distance there as we go to the top end of the chamber. Something like 700 metres from the back of the chamber to the entrance, which is down there. And here's that lovely arch, about 375 metres across, depending on exactly where you measure it.
So let's take a look at another one. Another favorite, favorite of ours is a chamber called Cloud Ladder Hall, uh, jointly explored by Chinese, American, and a few other nationalities, and quite a number of Brits. It is an absolutely staggering place. It was always known to be high. This is a photograph by Robert Schoen. I think we've seen it a couple of times this, uh, this weekend already, showing a caver, abseiling in through a small passage which gets, gets into the top of the entrance. So everybody knew how that this chamber was very tall, but nobody really understood how tall. And our laser scanning was able to show this. And I'm just going to bring this up. It'll just take a second. Sorry, it just takes a while to load. Just talk amongst yourselves. I'll move that across onto there. Can you see that on there? Oh, good, that's there now. Sorry, I've just ruined that by putting doing that. Okay, so here we are. Here's Cloud Ladder Hall, and you can move that around and have a good look at it, look at it and uh, generally see how things um, uh, uh, pan out. But you can do all sorts of things with this data. You know, you can cut a side away. I can cut the side away so you can actually, you know, look inside the chamber and have a look at the detail of the floor and the rocks and start to do contour analysis and all sorts of things to try and understand how these chambers work. But you can also do some fun other things, like if I just move out, put some well-known objects into the picture as well just to give you some idea of the scale of it. Yes, you can fit the Eiffel Tower completely inside Cloud Ladder Hall. That's not a lie, that's absolutely spot on. It is absolutely massive. There we are, just to give you an idea. Yeah, Cloud Adder Hall is taller than the Eiffel Tower, and if you take that horrible piece of rubble out of the bottom, you could fit the, ta the, the tower in without any trouble at all. Just fill that back, move on. Wonderful place. And here's another illustration here. This chamber, this uh, football stadium in the front here is actually the bird's eye uh, stadium in Beijing just to give you an idea of scale. And one of the reasons why the chambers are so much more, va more massive than these chambers is that they're very high. Cloud Adder Hall, we've seen, is almost 400 meters high. Um, uh, the one over the back end is Maus, of which more later is about 250 meters high. And um, Sarawak Chamber itself, for a large part of its area, is over 100 meters high. And that's how they start to get these bulk volumes. A couple of other interesting ones around the world. This is Majis El Jin. It's in Oman. We had a lovely opportunity to go and see some old friend of ours, uh, 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 Steve Jones and, Ka and Kathy Jones, who live out in Oman, and we were able to explore this wonderful cave here. It opens to the surface and then drops in by this wonderful black uh, drop, about 150 metres into the chamber, um, all in daylight, which is lovely. And we were able to do a scan uh, in daylight this time, so we were allowed to do, uh, so we could do colour, and so we've got this wonderful colour model of the chamber. This has actually been commercially useful. Um, it's currently being used to assess the location of some buildings at the top there that they want to build because they actually want to make this into a show cave feature. Oman is on a massive tourism drive at the moment, working out how to attract more people to go and see Oman. And by the way, if you get a chance to go, it's well worth it. It's an absolutely lovely country. But this shows this sort of detail. This is the point cloud data that you get out of the scanner, coloured because we, it was daylight and we could capture colour, and shows you the sort of detail that we've got. Incidentally, this is just a mere fraction of the data that we've got. Uh, typically, we collect somewhere in the region of between 100 to 130 billion points of data in a scanning session. But if I was to put all of those on this screen, the computer would take three years to do about one second of movement. Um, so we only use a small sample of the points uh, when we're doing things like this, uh, otherwise the computing power just, just couldn't process it. Well, that shows you some of the sorts of things that we're doing. But you can see you've got all the bands, all the structures, all the rock structures. You can measure the slopes of the, uh, uh, the, the debris that come out of the various different shafts if you wish to. Um, there's all sorts of work that you can do to a great deal of accuracy once you've got this sort of data. What's the kit like? Well, this is the kit in front of us. This is a Rigel VZ400, a faithful old friend of ours for the last five years. Why did we choose it? Um, we chose it for two basic reasons. One is it was designed for the mining industry, so it's fairly tough, and presumably 
um, is uh, capable of dealing with the conditions that we like to, uh, to use it underground. Now, if anyone wants to take £100,000 worth of kit and put it under a wa waterfall so that you can do some work, you know, you've got to be pretty confident uh, about its ability to actually, actually work and withstand those. And so far, so good, it's never let us down. Now, that's obviously in Gaping Gill, which was pretty wet conditions, but most of the time, of course, in the tropics, you're fairly dry. But it does get, you know, it has, has to get lugged around, it has to get um, you know, carted around, it has to go on aeroplanes, uh, it has to be, you know, thrown around by customs officials who haven't got a clue what it is uh, when you're going into various different countries. So, so we wanted something absolutely fantastically robust. How does it work? Basically, it works very simply by firing a laser beam and measuring the time it takes for that laser beam to get back to itself. It does that 400,000 times a second. Yeah, so you can, gather, you can imagine you gather up quite a lot of data from one particular position um, about the environment that you're working in. Of course, you have to do that several times so that you fill in all the gaps of the cave. Yeah, and gradually, you can build up a point cloud of, uh, of um, uh, the entire uh, cave that you're in. Is it perfect? Well, actually, I think it's probably just about as perfect a measurement system that you could possibly have. Let's take a closer look and let's do a scan. Just give a second to the software to boot up. So we've got that, and if I press uh, F6, if I press F6, come on. I hate demonstrations. Oh, sorry, I know what I've done. I haven't loaded the project. Silly idiot. Now if I press F6, yes, there we are. And then press F7, we can start to do a scan. Come on. I hate demonstrations, don't you? It'll come in a second. There we are. And what you'll see on this screen is this uh, machine is beginning to scan. And as it scans around, you can see the point gan gathering up. Now, I have to do something a little bit clever in a minute, because I have to block out the video camera by standing in front of it. Because although this laser is perfectly safe for your eyes, I don't encourage people to look at it. It is a laser when it's working. It's not very good for photographic equipment, and it would uh, burn the uh, videos out uh, if, the, if it caught the laser at just the right angle. So when the laser comes around to that angle, I'm just going to put my hand across the front of it so we don't hurt the, the, um, uh, the video cameras. But as you can see, this point cloud's gradually building up and we're scanning our room, and you can probably start to see some of the features uh, uh, starting to evolve. So you can start to see there's the screen and the back wall coming up. I could, if I uh, had time, put a camera on the top of this, calibrate the camera to the, um, to the uh, laser scanner, and collect color information as well at the same time. But actually, color's a little bit of a red herring. It's nice to have when you, uh, when you can get it, but actually for geological studies and things like that, it's not actually that fantastically uh, helpful. So I haven't worried about that here. So this particular setting takes about two minutes. And what we typically do on a cave is we set it up, run it while somebody's looking for the next station, pack it all up, move off to the next station, and move, up, or move on. We do about one station every 12 minutes when we're underground, which is pretty good going. That, when you're doing 60, 70 stations, is a pretty long day. But you can understand the need to be efficient, because if we can shave one minute off the time it takes to do a scan, if you've done 60 scans, that's an hour you've saved in the whole day. Uh, and I can assure you, when you've lugged that thing around Sarawak Chamber for 15 hours, uh, you're glad of that extra hour's kip. So here it comes, gradually coming around. I'm going to have to just... Um, when it's pointing to you, uh, uh, Paul, if you could just scream at me, because um, that's... Uh, that's the point where it's going to sort of point towards the cameras. You can see it gradually building up the auditorium as we go. What you're seeing here is fairly low resolution. Um, it's just a guide. Um, but what we're going to have a look at in the middle is the uh, detailed scan. So I'm just going to put my arm across that while it goes round past the cameras. We will have a hole in the scan, unfortunately, but that's OK for the purposes of what we're doing. Right, we're past. We're OK. Yeah, you can gradually see the auditorium build up. I suspect this is the first time that the RGS Lecture Hall has been surveyed. So this is another world's first for us. I'll tell you a little story about this. As you can imagine, along around the, uh, the caves is quite hard work. And in Maus Chamber, the largest chamber in the world by volume, 
Uh, Andy put the scanner down because he needed to find the way on and he was getting a bit tired lugging it all around. Anyway, two and a half hours later, we found it again. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Here's our scan. And as you can see, if we zoom in, we can see an awful lot of detail and all your wonderful faces um, in the scan. Yeah, you know, there's, I don't know who that is. I don't know, who's, who's that falling asleep? <laughs> That's three pints you owe me. Yeah, so you can actually sort of see, somebody obviously thinks this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, but you can see the sort of detail that you can get. And that allows us to, do, to, to actually study these chambers in a great deal of detail. So there's just a little bit of fun. No, I don't want to save it. I don't want to save your ugly mugs, do I? No, so let's move on. And if you had a cut camera on the top of it, this is Nenthead Mine. I don't know if any of you have been here uh, down the brewery shaft, but it shows you a quick view of the sort of detail that you can actually get from, uh, I think this was nine simple scans um, that we put together. You can see it picks out all of the individual mechanics and machinery here. It's just a little bit of fun uh, to show you. It's not just big chambers that this stuff's useful for. Um, so some heritage projects and just about anything that you can imagine. And you can see with the camera, when it's properly, uh, properly calibrated, it picks out even the shiny uh, crankshaft there. If that is a crankshaft, I'm no mechanic. Um, but you can sort of see the details. But that's not tidied up at all. That's not color balanced. That's just the way that it comes out of the machine. Let's move on. Let's have a look at a couple of the other chambers. This one was rather fun. Uh, we were lucky enough to go to Iran. If you ever have a chance to go to Iran caving, do not turn it down. It is absolutely wonderful. The Iranians are superb, and they've got some fantastically interesting caving. And you do see them advertising and pleading, even on UK caving, uh, for people to come out and go and see them. Don't turn it down. Wonderful cave, wonderful cave about an 80-meter pitch uh, into this lovely chamber. Turned out this cave was a complete surprise. We almost didn't go because we didn't believe it was going to be that big. But at the time, it turned out to be well inside the top 10 caves and was, and was a lovely surprise to us. Where are we going now? Oh, yes, we're going here. This is the Meow Room. This was a big surprise to us. We knew the Meow Room was big. We had no idea until we surveyed it, it was as big as it is. Absolutely beautiful place in the mid middle of China. And when we surveyed it with our uh, laser scanning, we actually discovered, rather disappointingly, because the French discovered it, or uh, well, the French explored it, I mean, the Chinese have known it for millennia, of course, uh, that it's actually bigger than Sarawak Chamber by volume, but not by area. So Mao Room, we believe at the moment, is the largest cave chamber in the world by volume. That stalagmite, just to give you some idea, is almost exactly the same dimensions as the Elizabeth Tower at the uh, Houses of Parliament, uh, not very far away from here, just to give you some idea. It may well be a candidate for the largest stalagmite in the world, but we haven't done any work or comparative work on that yet uh, to find out. Absolutely stunning place. So this is the results of our work. I do say at this point, so far, because there are in doing this project, some other candidates have evolved, um, which may challenge this. Um, the bits of work that I'm doing at the moment, I'm working with some Americans uh, at the moment to, to, to really tie down the precise mechanisms for measuring these things and the precise metrics for, uh, for doing that. But at the moment, this is the figures that we've got. I don't think that list will change terribly much, um, but that's, pr that's pretty much where, we are, where, we're, where, we're, where we're at. And other pieces of work that we're doing is we're starting to look at the geophysics of it all to try and work out the maths of how these, how these arches actually work. Um, but that's all in its very, very early stages at the moment. There are issues around this subject. First of all, what's a chamber? This is Ten Long Dong in China, um, which I had the privilege to survey. Clearly a passage. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Um, but there's probably a chamber in the middle highlighted there in red that you would call a chamber. But generally speaking, I think you'd call that a passage. I don't think anyone would argue with the fact that La Moneca Chamber in Mexico is a chamber. It looks very chamber-like. But there are issues. There is debate about whether indeed Mao Room in China is a, is a cave chamber or is indeed a passage. I think, generally speaking, the, the consensus of opinion is coming down on the fact that it is a chamber because these various parts are interlinked and interwoven and, wouldn't, and don't stand in isolation. However, if you take another similar chamber, we mentioned it before, Torca de la Calista, where you've got a similar effect here, where you've got a very, very low section in the middle, the cave doesn't really stand up. And if you 
isolated one of these parts away from the other. They are uh, geomorphologically quite separate. So the argument is probably that Torquilocleister is not one chamber, it's two, whereas the consensus of opinion at the moment is falling down on the fact that Mao chamber is actually a single chamber. But there are other issues as well. We talked about Magicel Jin uh, earlier on. I don't think there's any doubt that that's a chamber, but it's got a hole in the roof. So, what about things like El Satana de la Golostrinus? We've always considered it as one of the big pits of the world, but if you look at that survey, what's that different about it, other than the fact that it's taller and thinner? It's a big opening in the ground, and it's got a hole in the roof. Should that be included in the list as well? If we did do, yeah, if we did do, then its volume would be well inside the top ten uh, list. So, just to conclude of where we're at, there are other candidates. There's a new discovery in China, um, some French people are upset. They think a chamber called the uh, uh, Salle de l'Eclipse is actually bigger than Laverna. And indeed, there's the Martel Room in Skotsjanska. I hope I've said that right, um, uh, to survey as well. So it's not quite finished project, but we're nearly there. And then, of course, just to, just to stir it all up, there's other things to consider as well. There is a hydrothermic bubble in uh, Romania, estimated at actually staggering nearly 240 million cubic metres. There's Lake Vostok in Antarctica. Okay, these voids are not full of air, they're full of water, but should they be candidates as well? And of course, we're beginning to hear about lava tubes and chambers on Mars and the moon, and indeed the uh, satellite of, uh, is it Jupiter or um, Saturn? No, Saturn, thank you very much, I can't remember. Uh, it's probably just a blob of water covered in ice floating around that particular planet. And if we want to go and see a survey, of course, all I need is a ride, if you can... You can yeah, to go and do it. So, anyway, that's the sort of basic principles of it all. That's how it's all come about. So I'm going to hand over to Pete Smart, who's going to get all clever on us. Brilliant.